Oh, greetings everyone again from uh, North Memphis, right here um, in my little humble abode. I got to thinking about uh, one of my favorite comedians. I wouldn't say favorite, I would say somebody who I happen to listen to a lot because I'm interested in his takes. His name is Trey Crowder. He's otherwise known as the liberal redneck. And um, uh, I find him quite fascinating a figure. Um, he's a... He's not a redneck apologist. His shtick... I mean... Is that not all southerners are a certain way. You know, not all people who descended from the veterans of the Confederate Army are a certain, a certain way, and it's true. It's very true. I have known people who are literal uh, descended of veterans of folks in the Confederate Army who are, who, uh, who repudiate the mission, for example, for which that army was constituted. And uh, for those people, and uh, how it was recruited. And uh, However, I think he's a little wistful, um, a little, you know, a, a little, uh, he kind of glosses over the South a little bit, and he doesn't dive deep into the issues of, of the, of the, of, of, uh, of the general reality here. I will commend him for his, uh, pieces on explaining how we got all these statues and how the Jim Crow uh, historical revision uh, episodes in the beginning of the 20th and the middle of the 20th century during and as a result of and in reaction to the civil rights era uh, we got a, a lot of statues so specifically by the daughters of the American uh, daughters of the Confederacy uh, but uh, I, um, you know, it's kind of funny I mentioned Trey Crowder and com comedy as a, as a uh, specifically because when I was a kid, one time I was at the Randolph Branch Library across the street in, uh, you know, what is now the Barrio in Memphis, um, across the street from the place where uh, mom and dad used to go wash her clothes. And I checked out every book about being a comedian. And uh, Dad came over to where I checked out about 12 books or so. I was about 10 years old. And, says, and Lady looked at me and said, why do you want to be a comedian? I says, this is, you can't check out all these books. And he says, you know, and she was kind of laughing about it. She says, I say, ha, 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 I made you laugh. Of course, it was at my expense. And that's basically how things go now. I, I make people laugh at my own expense. Um, my my cadence and my timing of comedic anything is terrible so I had to find a real profession unlike Trey Crowder who has gone viral with um, um, discussions of topics that are much less incisive and much less relevant than yours truly will provide you uh, anyway but um, anyway but I do want to uh, especially now that we don't have sports uh, some of you who are fellow Southerners, uh, I'm Southern born, but I'm bred, of course, uh, having uh, come from Mexican immigrant parents. Uh, I need to, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, whatever your attitude is, especially if you are a descendant of uh, the Confederate Army or a espouser of the lost cause or a Trump and uh, supporter uh, that you listen to what I have to say and uh, if you are like me related to immigration from Mexico the, hopefully this explains a lot of what we observe and experience um, and why people don't care for example if you are part of the majority community here in Shelby County slash Memphis uh, African American. I hope that this um, demystifies and explains a lot of what 
you currently observe hopefully don't go through to as much of an extent of what we know about what has been your experience here uh, with people and um, the authority figures um, and if hopefully this um, video goes super super viral and if you're from some other part of the world this explains why things happen the way they do now in the United States in spite of our uh, the fact that we are we as um, a nation were birthed from 13 colonies that sought to um, conduct the experiment of institutionalizing the um, enlightenment of uh, the appropriateness and relevance of self-governance in a period when obviously uh, kings and queens were the dominant statesmen of the time. But um, I know I'm supposed to, not supposed to touch my face. I need to get a cone like a dog or something. But um, so anyway, much of we okay. So it's no mis mystery. First of all, why did why Trump got elected? I would say on the margins, it's because of the fact that um, he uh, ran against a. Uh, unpopular opponent in Madam Secretary Hillary Rodden Clinton. Um, so that was in play. If there would be some other figure, then Trump probably would have lost. Um, if the Republicans would have run somebody else other than Trump, uh, then um, Hillary would have lost even the popular vote. But, uh, you know, like a professional politician, for example. But, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there now. But we see now that Trump can continue to, uh, for example, demonize others, um, eviscerate our institutions, open up the private profiteering of our public goods um, and leave a lot of us to die on the vine um, in respect to this uh, this uh, pandemic that we have so anyhow so why is this so why is why is he such still such an endeared figure in American politics to very many especially around here well, it's not about, first of all, not, I, I'm making a mistake by making it about Trump. Um, I'm making a mistake about making it about, uh, yeah, about one person. Because what I want to feature is the overall um, zeitgeist, the overall attitudes of people in my area, in my sector, of the United States and um, how it is that uh, we see for example in the opening of our society in the first official weekend of summer uh, of our Memorial Day which is a problematic holiday in and of itself right now um, given, the, given the conduct of our military forces in recent years um, we uh, we see in a place uh, in Missouri three days ago a bar in Miss, uh, in this uh, next to a place called Lake of the Ozarks that had a swimming pool I believe attached to the lake have probably observably about 500 people um, shoulder to shoulder, just you know, dressed in in their swim swim gear, 
arm in arm uh, like they would any other at any other time just regaling in proximity um, the problem with this is that um, we've had these, these people you know all these people are generally in their 20s and they will go home to places like St. Louis it's kinda it's far away it's probably four hours St. Louis but not two hours from Kansas City not two hours from Springfield Missouri not two hours from Columbia Missouri which is in fact where the uh, where the University of Missouri is um, is uh, is located um, and I will probably close enough to a lot of places in Arkansas like uh, no the populated Northwest Arkansas where the University of Arkansas is well that place is about six hours from where I'm coming at you from equally six hours in the other direction <laughs> is the hometown of Trey Crowder which is Sevierville, Tennessee, who lives on the near side of the Smoky Mountains, Sevierville, Tennessee, just off of that ex relevant exit of Interstate 40, which for part of the way is a major uh, east-west thoroughfare uh, in the United States connecting uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean in North Carolina at Wilmington to the desert of the Mojave Desert of California where you break off and go to LA or San Diego or wherever you know uh, from where you're Vegas or from where, where you are um, but um, so yeah this uh, maybe some of them will come back to some place that um, within commuting distance from Memphis I hope not I hope not, because we saw what happened in the pool over in Las Olas Beach in Fort Lauderdale in March. This was March, okay. And this set off, this set off, it, it elevated, it got them on a higher curve all over in many metropolises um, in the eastern part of the United States. Nashville, New Orleans, Houston, Miami, Atlanta, even New York and Washington. People went back home for spring break, and um, they were, you know, they were visibly even catching coronavirus and talking horse to each other and making jokes about it. And they thought they were invincible. They probably were invincible, but their grandmothers and grandparents and parents are not invincible. So we saw a short spike in cases and deaths. And um, but here we are in Memorial Day. And um, my part of the country, uh, the mid-southern United States, and I put Ozark, I would definitely put the Ozark part of Missouri within my general cultural imprint here, as we are right here. Um, it's still southern, still authoritarian. Still, uh, obviously, rebellious of authority and responsibility to the other, and comfortable within a tribe. Um, see, those people, despite you know, you have people like Dr. Fauci who they discard. People like. Uh, you know, we know about things where we know about people uh, forcing themselves into their respective state capitals all over this country uh, in on on mass and catching the virus. So how do they think that after three months since the first uh, infection in the United States, we're gonna they're gonna be they weren't in any kind of danger? Well. I don't know. It's a New York thing. It's a Seattle thing, a Chicago thing, a Houston thing, 
a Florida thing, a Atlanta, Georgia thing. Poor guys. Poor Georgia. Poor Florida. Anyway. Mm, mm -mm, they're going to have it bad. But now I fear Missouri is going to have it bad. Very bad. Um, because of what these kids did out there at the Lake of the Ozarks. But okay, so how do we get how do we get to this reality? You know, how is it that we are able to how is it that we have come to decide that we as a nation, especially as a southern United States, we see all these states here that were last to close uh, to establish social distancing and first to reopen despite all caution. Well, we have here in the South a legacy that was uh, of the greatest mass brainwashing of the people from the dominant economic interest interests of the day. Uh, when the South became, the, especially the Mid-South, became the Mid-South. Okay, we're not talking about the 13 colonies or Virginia, the Carolinas and whatnot. Okay? When those folk came over because they opened up the land and gave grants to folk to come over and cultivate what was now a ridiculously priced cash crop, cotton. Okay? Because when this place became independent, 1790, well, when Tennessee became a state, let's say 1796, uh, right here on the bluff, there was a Spanish fort. Um, there were not a lot of people of any kind. Uh, Spanish soldiers, some English and Spanish pioneers, Chickasaw Native Americans, of course. Um, that, that were hunting around in this area, but this pick game, this this place would soon become rather populated because of the rush, the first rush, which was cotton. Cotton was a, became a very important raw material. People would got an acre or whatever they were. The Fed, federal government would grant them, entitle them to come over from, you know, the Carolinas, Virginia, uh, Maryland, wherever, and come over the Appalachians and come here because this place was full of awesome red clay soil to grow cotton. And Memphis was a place where it could be put on a ship. And put uh, or a barge and floated down to New Orleans. So, the Miss Southern United States had about 80% of the supply for, certain, uh, for a certain time in the early 19th century, in the uh, antebellum 19th century. 80% of the world supply. Um, and uh, in Great Britain they had all these text mills, textile mills because of the um, uh, of the Industrial Revolution. Guess what? The price of cotton went and so whatever schmo came over to with his own hands on not expansive plot of land um, could make money for the whole year. by selling his crop. Now, so what if you were rich from over there, from the Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, and came over here, you got so rich that you got to build yourself a mansion within one generation in the Victorian or the Spanish style. Um, and uh, you lived like nobility. Because 
you got to buy you got to buy up all this land and you got to buy what was also the most expensive financial asset of the time which was human beings from West Africa but um, there weren't that many people who actually got to live in these mansions and live that kind of life Obviously, the opinion of the world was beginning to turn away from the slave institution. But that was easy for them to do because they did not grow cotton yet in southern Mexico or Egypt or Central Asia in such great uh, quantities as they did afterwards. So these folks did not have the votes because there were so few of the landed gentry. And... Uh, so how do they get these um, very well-to-do peasants to vote the way they wanted to, to fight in their armies in several military campaigns of expansion and defense in the um, in the those notable decades of the 19th century? Well, basically these super rich people obviously controlled the politics notably one very uh, um, like people like Andrew Jackson and Cal Hoover and uh, their protégés uh, what's his name Polk like Jackson also from Tennessee uh, they championed and many people at the state, county, municipal level, of course, championed the, um, the slave institution. The preachers championed the slave institution because, of course, the power came from the source of money, which was cotton, less so tobacco and sugar. What about the press? Well, the advertisers were all swimming in cotton money, of course. So the editorial role of the, uh, of the publications of the press here was, of course, to promote the institution or preserve the institution of chattel slavery when the world and the country was turning away from it and becoming, uh, you know, uh, and, and opposing it. But how do they get the peasants? We we'll call them the rednecks. How do they get them to abandon our enlightenment, uh, libertarian, um, humanistic, uh, constitutional heritage? to build up the pastoral tyranny of chattel slavery and cotton. To put other human beings in chains. Well, the press, the politicians, and the preachers. The preachers of both the mainline African American and the uh, Southern Baptist mainline Southern Baptist uh, denominations of course were all in it they were all in it they weren't going to give up their gravy train the punchline here is there are four viruses they implanted in the heads of the folks that were going to later um, in, you know, clandestinely support the Texas Revolution, then openly war against Mexico, and their just, um, their, the just revenge was to form the Confederate Army and get decimated by the North then. What are these four viruses? 
Well, they had to tell people, of course. Uh, they had to get people, even though they had more in common with the African Americans and the slaves, uh, because they had to work the land, except they had to work it for free, though. Um, they would, uh, they had to convince them against their own interests that they were subhuman, that they did not get to, uh, that they did not deserve the blessings of, 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 uh, of liberty. They had to say that, um, you know, these, that they, uh, they were, their destiny was to take over the land that belonged to Mexico in order to expand uh, the land available to slave agriculture and acquire more states that were slave states. Um, they had to say the North was alien and odd and weird um, you know, in its diversity and its manufacturing. You know, there'd be little snippets uh, in the in the uh, in the press in the commentary that said, "Oh yeah, the life and the mechanic. Oh, the, don't work in those dirty, dingy uh, factories. That's not your life. You're meant for something better." And the last thing that I mentioned, the fourth virus that to implant is that this government which was constituted for us, for the general welfare, was tyrannical. And it had to be fought. And it had to be, and they had to abandon it and form something else. More laissez-faire, more, more authoritarian. Um, more oppressive to others. Basically, institutionalized fascism in the southern United States. Um, well, by implanting these viruses into these people's heads, they got them to accept slavery, to abandon their crops to volunteer for war against Mexico. Okay, can we see the attitudes towards this why does Mexico and the flag, Mexican flag, have such a special... Well, why is it so it's particularly irritating to people? I mean, there are foreign flags all over the place here. But there's a special enmity towards the Mexican flag in the South. And the people. But again, as I said last week, love the culture, hate the people. And finally, to take up arms against the U.S. Army. If, if that is not the craziest thing. Look, as a historian said, the United States, while the United States was conducting the um, resubjugation of the South, let's say, Harvard and Yale were still rowing on the Charles River. So sports didn't stop for, for that. Now, today, the folks whose DNA has been, whose mental DNA has been forever through the generations altered by these viruses that were let go from the lab of Richmond, Virginia and Montgomery, Alabama, back in the day these viruses are being utilized like if the, you know the 5G sends out and we're activated to act a certain way <laughs> talk about projection to defend other material interests of the day oh we don't want the government involved in healthcare like it is in all the other rest of the world. No, because you don't deserve that month, that, that, get another job, because that job that you're doing flipping burgers for me is what? Uh, is, uh, you don't deserve health care. That's for, that's for a teenager. I wonder how they feel now.
they've lost their jobs, huh? The biggest material interest today in the United States is the sickness of Americans. The obesity, the diabetes, the cancer, the heart disease. These are not just lifestyle. These are actually um, uh, environmental, food, and water supply uh, causes. Because we weren't always as big, you know, myself included. This wasn't always the problem. But healthcare, healthcare is the most profitable racket in the United States because we have extortionist middlemen, the richest uh, called the insurance companies and big pharma. You don't believe me? The difference between what we should be paying for these lousy outcomes and what we are paying for these lousy outcomes, let's see, why we have 18% of our entire GDP going towards medicines and doctor's time and hospitalization, okay, and why is, why is it allowed to absorb all from resources from all of the sectors? Okay, the difference between what we ought to be paying for these lousy outcomes and what we are paying is profit. Is profit to the shareholders and the executives of these industries, and they cannot, they cannot um, do without it. Like the landed gentry of during the slave period, the richest people in the world, they were willing to destroy or try to destroy the United States to defend their institution. They obviously did enormous moral and intellectual injury to their people. So now, they're doing the same. These people don't need, these robber barons of the healthcare sector do not need a country. But they count on the distraction through sports, for example, and the false generation of enmity among the people who actually generate their, their profits to provide political cover. And the modern manifestation of historical viruses is why we have these crazy dynamics going on in our clergy, in our press, in our business sector, in our politics, in our social discourse. This stuff that has generated way, way back.